Vince McMahon um, lied to me and he cheated me in uh, Montreal. That son of a bitch screwed me. Because there was no benefit to it, there was no gain to it. The ultimate program of all times in the history of wrestling would be you and Vince McMahon doing storylines for a year. Is there any chance, is there any price that that would happen? No, never. Watching that again, the thing that stands out is the pause. No, so definitive. That was almost exactly a decade ago. Today, Bret Hart's here, and the answer is yes. Why? Well, you know, every, you know, everyone. <clears throat> you know, that's a good question. I'm sure everyone's curious. Yeah, I don't about think it. it's the first time that you've been asked no, that question. But uh, you know, I don't rarely get a chance to answer it. And uh, the truth is, um, I thought it would be fun. I thought I needed a little adventure, and um, I had some time where I was found I was doing nothing, and I thought, you know, why not? And I kept kind of taking the why nots against the whys and sort of balance them, and in the end I couldn't come up with enough sensible reasons why I wouldn't go back and have a little fun. A lot of people are saying that he's doing it for the most logical reason people go to work, and that is to make money. Is this about money? Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, hopefully I'll make some money, but it's not. Well, I assume that, that you got a guarantee. I mean, you are, if nobody else, educated in the ways of Vince McMahon. Yeah, but it was never really about the money. And even when I talked to him about it, I, it was money was not a big issue for me or a fact. We didn't didn't dicker about so much about what I was going to get paid. It was more about what they might do with me and how we could make it fun <clears throat> and a way to make it a, a really a big negative that took 13 years of my life thinking about it and wor not worrying about it, but like. You know, always having it at the back of my head and sort of being angry about what happened and trying to take something negative and turn it into a positive. So let me read you a quote, that, uh, something that you wrote. I mean, you are a writer, right? You wrote a great book. You have all these blogs. And I went back and it said, if Montreal hadn't happened, I'd have been there at Over the Edge. I guarantee you Owen would never have been up in the rafters in the first place. So my brother wouldn't have died that day. The Hart family wouldn't have been ripped apart during a lawsuit. I wouldn't have been in the WCW and sustained a career-ending concussion. That's a pretty long list of reasons why you should never work with Vince McMahon again. Fair enough, but at the same time, I'm a 52-year-old man that, um, you know, I'm sitting at home. I, I suffered a stroke in 2002, and a few years ago back, I did Aladdin with the Ross Petty and all that. It was a lot of fun for me, and I, had, I enjoyed it, and I found myself um, all these years later going, if I was to go back and could go back on my own terms, is there any way I could do it where it could be fun and I could almost um, make light of what happened and sort of, you know, everything that happened, clearly what happened with my brother Owen was an accident. I don't think anyone refutes that much anymore. So I don't, I think Vince McMahon and the WWE for all these years kind of carried around a lot of uh, heartache related to all that stuff. Cause I don't think anyone felt good that that happened or it was just a sort of a touchy sore spot for everybody. And I think even uh, a few months ago when I did the big handshake with Shawn Michaels in the middle of the ring, I think it was a, it was a real uh, weight off his, off his back, and sort of I, I, I believe in my own little way that I kind of set Sean free that day. And uh, I want to talk about Sean and Triple H and the others in in a moment after after we go to commercial. But before that, the way you're saying it, you know, is is heartfelt and honest. I'm a 52 year old man. I'm sitting at home. Isn't that a, a huge problem in wrestling in general? It's tough to give it up. Well, I, I'm not. I didn't go back because I had to have it or I needed it. I was kind of like, like I said, kind of an adventure. Like, you know, it's kind of fun to get back on an airplane and fly and I don't have the schedule that the wrestlers have and just to kind of play a bit part on the show. And Who leaves wrestling, Brett? Who of your generation left wrestling and said, you know, I'm retiring, I'm gonna go on and they had another career and they lived happily ever after? Well, there's a handful that, you know, have moved on or don't go back. You know, like you look at Macho Man or Warrior and some of these guys, they, they've never really necessarily come back. I'm sure some of them think about coming back and if they could kind of create a way that, that might be fun and do what I'm doing, they might consider it. But, you know, what I'm doing has been a relatively um, light schedule and it's been fun for me to do so far. And I, I feel that um, when I initially approached them about it, I mean, they didn't come to me, I came to them. And I basically talked about um, trying to turn a negative into a positive and making it just a better ending than the one I had at the end. 
Back in the day, the guys you wrestled with, uh, a lot of them uh, aren't here anymore because a lot of them have died. It must be a profound experience for you to walk into a WWE dressing room. Well, you know, they're, they're right. They're just, like, you know, I managed myself when I was 52 years old. I'd be probably sit on my back porch with Kurt Henning and Owen and Davey Boy having a few beers, laughing about all the, you know, the old times and stuff. But, you know, I found one of the, the hardest parts of um, my retirement has been that everybody I know died. They're all, there's hardly any of them around anymore. And, you know, the ones that are around are most of them are train wrecks. And, you know, to go back and see the wrestlers of today in contrast to the wrestlers of yesterday. I mean, the, the kids today, they're, I call them kids because they're, they're all uh, completely different attitude. They, they all go, they're, seem like they're in bed by 11 or something like that. They're, nobody's out drinking and carousing like the old, uh, the old wrestlers from my era. And, you know, they're, they're much more um, focused than, uh, than we were, and they're a lot smarter. Unfortunately, the wrestlers of yesterday, the sheiks and, you know, that type, they never, never saved their money. No one ever taught them how to... No, no, they never had any skills or education on how to save their money and how to invest and what to do when you make so much money. And these are the things you got to lay out money for and all Fascinating RFPs. whether the new generation will be able to learn from the mistakes of the old generation. I want to ask you, hold on to those thoughts. I want to ask you about a couple of guys. Uh, I want to ask you about Shawn Michaels. I want to ask you about Triple H, about Ric Flair. What do you think about those guys? We'll do that next with Brett, the Hitman Hart. Good to see you. Hold on, hold, hold on, hold on. Shawn Michaels crying in the dressing Shawn room? Shawn Michaels left like a baby in the dressing room. But Shawn was a guy that was very insecure and very, uh, I think, weak as a person. Uh, I'd say he was a two-faced, lying chicken He was the kind of guy that would make fr friends with you or bury the hatchet with you 10 minutes later, and 10 minutes later he'd be out there stabbing you in the back. I think I have to say this. It should be said that Bret Hart has been the most important guest in this show's history. You put us on the map partly because of your candor. So uh, I have heard it before today, and I'm hearing it now, your candid, honest thoughts. Let me throw out some names. We've done this before. And you tell me what you think of these guys. Not necessarily in the ring, but in general. You know okay. where I'm going first, right? Who am I going to ask you? You're going to ask me about Sean. Yeah. You know, with Sean, you know, he's, uh, he's a Christian now, and I don't know, for years, I, I, I never ever thought of myself uh, ever forgiving Sean for what happened to me, and I still, I will never forget what happened, and I don't necessarily forgive it all the way. I mean, I forgive it to a certain degree, but, you know, when uh, I saw Sean, and we talked briefly that afternoon before we went in the ring, <clears throat> and I could tell that he was, he was quite... Um, taken back by my, um, you know, I was really open with him and, and quite uh, sincere with him about trying to put all this behind and that as far as shouldn't I'm concerned. Shouldn't that be what he did, though, to you? Like, like you were the injured party, in theory. Shouldn't he have come to you? Maybe you're being the bigger man. Yeah, well, I think I took the first step, and I think that meant something to him because, to be honest, I believe that they all had so much shame and guilt that they didn't really want to take that step. But when From I, what happened in Survivor Series? Yeah. About. So I think when I met Sean that day and when I basically forgave him right in the ring in front of everybody, it was far more real than people think. I know everything in wrestling seems like it's all a rehearsed or a put on in a lot of time. But well, it is. But with uh, <laughs> Sean that day, it was very sincere in the way we were talking to each other. Um, I could sense after I, you know, I always had this feeling that after when I see Sean prancing around and that it didn't really mean anything to him that he's still a little jerk that it would bother me and then I would I feel like I sold myself out but the truth is is that I think once I kind of took all that weight off Sean's back that he's been a better person to me anyway and we've kind of picked up where we left off and we're like old friends like we were once upon a time let me which throw is really a couple strange. of names just a few seconds Triple H Triple H I've only seen him a couple of times and I you know, we've talked very briefly you don't like him we were never close friends. And no, you didn't like him. You said on the show, I don't like Triple H. No, I, I think like would be too big a word. Ric Flair. Flair, you know, I feel sorry for him. Like you were talking about wrestlers that when, do, when is enough enough kind of thing. When do they ever give up and go home to their families and their real lives? Rick's, I think, one of those kind of guys. He's a little bit ahead of me. But I remember a time sort of knowing that I had to get out of wrestling and go home to my kids before they were grown up and gone and that I had no family life. 
And I think wrestlers yeah. make this decision. I'm sure Hogan's the same and different guys where they decide they got to go home to their families or they got to stay in the wrestling business and that becomes your family. And uh, Flair stayed in the wrestling business, forgot about his family. His family moved on and left him. And the only thing Ric Flair knows is the dressing room, the airports, the bar after and drinking and talking about... That sums about up everything we were talking about. Sorry, I got to cut you off. This is, has been fascinating.